uh, good morning everyone uh, my name is uh, Reynos Musha uh, this is my cell phone number and this is our website address as well so a uh, private institution that offers uh, classes for risk management uh, for students uh, from different institutions as well. And part of our offering is risk management for RSK 403, uh, 04, and 05. So now we're going to be looking at uh, risk management for creative risk management, which is RSK 404, right? So the information of exactly how we offer the classes, uh, the timetable of the classes, uh, how to access our material as well, we have done that on our during our induction class. Uh, if you don't have the access or the link to the video of what we did for the induction class, uh, please feel free to send me a WhatsApp message and I'll share the link as well because it's a very, very important video because it gives you a guideline of exactly what to expect between now and to your right to exams in, uh, in February next year. So it's a very, we, the first class that we did, we did look at it in detail and exactly what to expect, how we're going to look at assignments, um, what we're going to do during the revision period, how to access the material, how to access the videos on our website, how to uh, download the textbooks as well uh, from our Google Drive as well. So we have given you uh, that and we covered that information when we did the first class where we looked at induction. So if you don't have the, if you didn't att attend the class or you don't have the link to the video where we're looking at uh, the induction class as well, please feel free to send me a WhatsApp message and I will share the video with you as well. So today, our agenda is to go through uh, the different study units as well for the curriculum. So we're now starting with the different study units for the curriculum. And if you check on the study guide, you'll see that um, uh, we are going to be starting off uh, with topic one, which looks at introduction uh, to credit risk management. And when we look at introduction to credit risk management, uh, chapter one, so we are going to be basing, uh, so you'll see that when we go through the different chapters, we are going to be concentrating uh, on uh, the textbook by C.B. Joseph. So that's the textbook that we're going to be concentrating on. Then when we go through the assignments, that's when we also, when necessary, we refer to the other text, two textbooks that we can also be able to utilize as well. So usually when it comes to the assignments, that's when we can refer to the other two textbooks so that we're able to have more information where if there's any information that's not given in this uh, C.B. Joseph textbook, we can refer to those other two textbooks as well but for the assignments. But you see that when it comes to the exam, uh, we the exam usually concentrate a lot more on the material that is covered in CP Joseph as well. So usually the other two textbooks are usually relevant when it comes to the assignments as well, mainly because sometimes there is information that is not given in detail in CP Joseph, which way we can now refer to the other textbook to use them for assignments as well. So today we're going to be looking at uh, chapters one, uh, chapter two, and see how far we go with chapter three as well. So today we're going to be looking at to uh, topic one, which looks at introduction. So going to the textbook where we look at um, chapter one of the textbook, chapter one of the textbooks looks at credit basics, right? So chapter one of the textbook looks at credit basics. And on section 1.1, we look at the meaning of credit. And here they say, roughly, we can define credit as a transaction between two parties in which one, supplies money, goods, services, and securities in return for a promise of future payment by the other, which is the debtor or the borrower. So such transactions normally include the payment of interest to the lender. So in this case, it means credit is not cost-free. It means the creditor needs to be compensated for deferring of consumption. So for them to defer consuming their money now because they are lending you that money, it basically means that they need to be compensated for that as well, for that activity of lending you that money. And how are they compensated? Through the interest that's going to be charged on the credit asset as well. So you will see that um, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, the concept of credit, take note that we are mainly looking at credit risk management from a supplier of credit perspective, right? 
So remember they say there's, this, uh, there's this, a lender and then there's a borrower, right? So unless otherwise stated, when we look at credit risk management from RSK.04, we're mainly looking at it from the perspective of the supplier of credit, unless otherwise stated. And usually the most common supplier of credit would be uh, banks as well. So when you look at uh, the, the banks, how their financial um, uh, statement looks, you will see that from the bank's perspective, the, their balance sheet looks like assets is equal to equity plus liabilities, right? So when you look at their balance sheet as well, the equity is where we look at um, ordinary share capital, and then there's also reserves, but we basically look at uh, it from the perspective of ordinary share capital, right? So this is basically the equity or the capital that is provided by the owners of the financial institution, in this case, which will be the bank. So if we look at it from a perspective of the bank, the accounting equation says your assets is equal to equity plus liabilities, right? So which means that on the equity side, this is basically the capital that, provi that is provided by the owners of the bank, which is the owner share, cap uh, which is the owner share capital, right? And the capital that also forms out of, out of it, which is the, which would be also the reserves as well. Then there's also liabilities. Where from the liabilities, this is where you look at debt financing provided to the bank and other liabilities as well of of very of much importance. This is where we look at depositors. Then on the asset side, this is basically where the bank is going to be having those income generating assets that they're going to be utilizing. Like for example, where the bank is gonna be offering loans, whether it's mortgage loans or uh, short-term loans or long-term loans to the bank, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the customer, uh, to, to its customers. It can also be through securities that the bank is going to be investing in as well. So which means, when you look at credit risk management, the reason why we would be interested very much in credit risk management is mainly because, remember we said the supplier of the credit is the one that's gonna be giving, for example, loans to these customers there, right? So which means that the reason why we are very much interested in the credit risk management is mainly because we are saying, if there's going to be any losses that emanate from here, how are we going to ensure that we mitigate the risk of the losses that are going to emanate from here, right? So which means normally it would mean that if there's going to be any losses that are going to be offered or emanating from here, we would expect that the ordinary share capital is going to be able to absorb these losses as well. So that at the end of the day, the reason why we are very much concerned about credit risk management is mainly because any credit risk that emanates from here we need to make sure that we're also able to uh, uh, protect the suppliers of debt for the bank, in, in, as an example in this case, mainly the depositors. Because mainly because if the depositors don't have um, confidence in the system, it basically means that they are going to be having a run for the bank. And when they run for the bank as well, it basically means that they're going to end up over with the drawing, which means the bank might not have enough um, money available to mitigate or to meet the needs of the depositors as well. So which means they we need to also ensure that the, the losses that are going to be suffered from the income generating activities for the bank, if there's going to be any losses, they, there's going to be enough capital available to absorb those losses and not end up affecting the depositors as well. That's why you see that in our case, in the South African case, we are very, very much, in, very much in, interested on what happened with the UBS bank. And from the US perspective as well, remember recently now, they're also talking about the Silicon Valley Bank as well, and exactly. Uh, so these two banks are very, very important and very much interesting on exactly what really unfolded in, within these financial institutions or banks that resulted in what these banks going down as well. So it's very, very interesting to see how, from a credit risk management perspective, how it relates to the, uh, what happened to these two banks where, which also resulted in what these banks are facing financial difficulties as well. So the intricacies of uh, these um, cases when from a credit risk management perspective, we're going to be looking at it in detail when we look at the other chapters where, for example, 
uh, where we look at um, chapters uh, 13 and 14, where we look at um, the managing the risks that are basically coming from uh, these uh, uh, activities of the bank as well, and how one can be able. So where the banks are going to be caught up between um, making profits and also managing the risk. Because we know generally, the higher the risk, the higher the expected return. But how do banks now manage to ensure that uh, because the, the lesser the capital the bank maintains here, the more they're able to use that money for uh, profit generating activities. But at the same time, we know that the lesser the capital the bank uh, has there, the lesser the protection of the depositors as well in case of losses. So that's basically what we're going to be looking at as well. So we're going to be looking at this in detail in other chapters as well. But when you look at credit risk management, we are basically saying that how do you manage the credit risk coming from the income generating of the active of the bank so that we're able to ensure that what we protect the suppliers of credit for the bank as well, especially when you look at depositors as well. Are there any questions so far? Any questions? So, so far we have been introduced to uh, uh, what credit uh, to um, the, to the definition of uh, uh, of credit, right? So so far we have been introduced to the definition of credit. On the next section, which is on page five of the book, uh, on the next section, which is on page five of the book, we now look to see exactly they say naturally a small percentage of debtors. So naturally, a small percentage of debtors won't pay back the credit as promised, sometimes even sending the creditor into bankruptcy. But the majority of debtors meet their commitments. So that is why the world economy survives. So credit losses or bad debts occur in both finance and non-finance businesses. The reason vary in certain cases if the credit is extended to crooks, it is a bad debt with from inception. However, the bulk of credit losses happen because the genuine because of genuine business failures. So the reasons vary from an increase in competition, new technology, substitutes, increase in prices, decline in demand, overestimation of demand, oversupply position in the market, government regulation union problems, mismanagement, death of key persons, business cycles, and over ambitious projects, financial losses, excess leverage, concentrated exposure, defective diversification, and so on. So these are some of the reasons why uh, that results in what business failures. Is there any question regarding any one of the reasons that has been given as a reason of business failures before we move on? Any questions? So these resulting business failures would now result in credit losses to the financial organization, which means uh, these credit losses would now end up affecting what? The viability of the organization as well. So here they say, a proper credit risk analysis will bring to light the probability of credit loss arising out of genuine business factors. So there are situations where the creditor ends up losing even if the data settles the Jews on time. Three such situations are described below. So which means that the data, they pay back the principal amount, they pay the interest on time, but at the same time, the creditor or the supplier of credit end up losing. So the first situation in which uh, such would, give, uh, would arise is one, the first one is that one to say, one instance is inflation. If the rate of inflation exceeds interest rates, the suppliers of credit are badly affected. So which means in this case, if the rate of inflation exceeds interest rate, it basically means that your return on the investment is not going to be able to keep up with what levels of inflation, which means that when your money is paid back, you are not going to be able to buy the same amount of things that you were able to buy before you lent out this money. So here's an example you say, Given, uh, we give an example of someone borrowing 600,000 to buy a house. If interest is 10% and inflation is 
What does that mean? The supplier of the credit is going to uh, is going to be able to get interest rate uh, interest income of sixty thousand. Sorry, of um, of sixty thousand. But at the same time, the cost of the goods that they are going to be buying going to the future is going to be increasing by one hundred twenty thousand. So what does that mean? It basically means that the supply of credit space is worse off in this case, because after or after a given period of time, they are able to earn an income of sixty thousand, but at the same time, the cost of goods and services is increasing by one hundred twenty thousand, which means their income is being surpassed by the cost of what goods and services as well. So because of this, it basically means that the supply of credit is going to be worse off than what they were previously when the contract was initiated. So are we on the same page when it comes to the, the first scenario? Any questions? The second scenario is where they say, in the second instance of devaluation of a foreign currency in which the debt is denominated, the creditor loses to the extent of the rate of devaluation, which means in this case, if the supplier of credit, uh, uh, if the supply of, uh, in this case, if the supply of credit suffers the devaluation of their currency, it basically means that when the money is paid back eventually, the borrower is going to be having to uh, pay less to settle the amount because of the movements, not in exchange rate as well. Like for example, in this case, when, um, when, uh, when, they, uh, let's say for example, uh, when their currency in which the, uh, the, the supply is originally, uh, originally from uh, depreciates in value. It basically means that after a given period of time, they raise a certain amount of money that they're giving out as, uh, as a loan to a particular customer. Then after a given period of time, if the currency in which the customer belongs strengthened against the home currency of the supply of credit, what is going to happen? It basically means that their currency is going to lose value when it comes to being able to buy goods from others, uh, from the from foreign sources. But at the same time, you find that the supply, the borrower in this case, since the currency of the supply of credit is devalued value uh, relative to the um, uh, to the borrower in this case, it basically means that the borrower will be having to pay uh, to raise less amount of money to pay back the principal amount from which they what they borrowed the money as well. So that's basically where we say that in this case, this is where the supply of credit end up losing money because of that devaluation of their home currency. Are we on the same page when it comes to the second reason? Any questions? The third scenario in which the supply of credit will end up losing money, even though the borrower pays the principal and the print, uh, interest in, uh, in, in full, they say another instance it will be non-compliance with money laundering uh, with anti-money laundering measures implemented by the central bank of the most of the countries so which means in this case uh when it comes to the issue of money laundering this is where you look at uh kyc policies so know your client uh know your customer policies and procedures as well so which means that's why you see that for example in this case uh the the supply of credit in this case which will be the banker would be in trouble if they don't do the proper KYC pro, uh, 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 procedures as well with, before they give out credit to the customer. Like for example, you look at um, where they don't have a proper up-to-date proof of residence of the client and they don't have a proper up-to-date identification of the client as well, which means that over time the banks or the financial institutions, they, make, they need to make sure that they also have what proper up-to-date um, KYC information about the client in that case to avoid issues of what money laundering as well. And this is very, very important, relevant, especially when you look at the case of South Africa, where you you heard over the previous weeks, where they say that South Africa was gray listed as well. And because of this, it basically means that what the cost of doing, doing business uh, for South African business is also going to be very difficult if they're going to be transacting with what other institutions abroad as well. So which means in this case, they would end up losing out when it be due to the effects of uh, uh, non-compliance, especially with money laundering as well policies. So here they say, 
Similarly, if sanctions are imposed on certain countries, then dealing with or lending to the customers in such countries can also spell trouble and result in losses as well. So we also see the, the case of North Korea, and we also see the case of uh, Venezuela, which will also hit with uh, sanctions as we've seen. And then we also see uh, the case of um, Russia as well, that, were, that was also hit with sanctions, which basically means that they remember the Russia was also uh, removed from the SWIFT, SWIFT, uh, SWIFT um, uh, system as well, which basically means that doing businesses with institutions within Russia is also made very difficult as well. And because of this, it basically means that the cost of doing business for the supplier in this case of credit is gonna be a bit more as well. So are there any questions regarding these three scenarios? Any questions? Moving on. So here they say, why list the risk that a borrower may default on obligations is known as credit risk? The risk that a foreign government may fail to honor the credit related obligations is uh, defined as sovereign risk. So it may, it may be noted that the legal remedies in the event of sovereign risks are limited. Hence, when extending extending credit to a business firm located in a foreign country, it is better to ascertain the level of sovereign risk than to study the risk of the business firm, mainly because uh, the level of sovereign risk is also going to be very, very important because even if the business uh, uh, risk procedures are, are sound, sovereign risk can basically supersede all that and also end up not increasing the cost of doing business for that particular organization as well, even if their internal systems are sound as well. On section 1.2, we also look at the role of credit. So here they say, when you look at the role of credit, it say, I do economic resources can be effectively put into use through credit. So which means when you look at idle economic resources, resources being effectively put into use through credit, this is where we look at the relationship between uh, the supply of credit, which is the investor, and through the intermediary, which is the financial institution, and then the borrower of credit, which is basically uh, the party that is needing to borrow money from the financial institution as well, right? So which basically means that when the supply of credit, which is, invest, is, which is the investor, has excess fund, instead of putting that money under the bank, that money could be best utilized by what? But through putting that money in the banking system, and then from the banking system, the money can now be more efficiently utilized by what? By the borrower in this case, where they can be able to utilize what? To increase the economic activity of the country as a whole as well. So here they say, from a macroeconomic perspective, the main function of the financial system in any country is to mobilize resources for economic growth. So the financial intermediary is not only intermediate between servers and investors, but set economic prices of capital in line with the monetary policy of the nation as well. So which means in this case, they say, uh, financial intermediaries play a vital role in making the credit available. So those financial institutions like banks who can recheck the loan process given to one party from another can in fact increase the credit availability in the economy as well. Because remember, they are looking at uh, getting money from those parties with excess funds and then more efficiently uh, displacing those funds to what? Those parties who want what? Be able to utilize those funds as well. So which means the assumption here is that the funds are being utilized for creating more value within the economic system as well. So which means in this case, when you look at the cost of credit, this is basically where you look at what? For example, prime plus a certain percentage depending on the credit rating as well, which means that the cost of this is basically how you're going to be able to arrive at the cost of credit. So here they say, prudent use of credit results in economic growth of borrowers, which in turn leads to the overall economic well-being of the society and ultimately the country. So credit stimulates both household consumption and business investment. Hence, a national credit policy is an important tool used to encourage industrial development and business investments 
thereby creating employment opportunities, improving the standard of living of the general population. So as purchasing power increases, people will tend to spend more on consumer goods and this will further stimulate the economic growth as well. So it's more like what? An economic cycle where you look at the industry, employing people, and then the people getting income from that. And then they, from the income, they use that income dot to spend more money from the suppliers. Then the suppliers spend more money or what with the industry. So it's basically and, uh, how the economic system now ends up what improving when you look at uh, through the use of what credit in that case. So here they say, usually the state of the credit markets will reflect the relative health of a larger economy as a whole. Often the prevailing interest rates and risk appetite for various grades of credit are some of the indicators of the state of the credit market. So please take note of section 1.2. I still remember uh, a question coming in the exam. I think it was about a five mark question or so where they ask you to discuss the role of credit in the economic system as well. So you need to be able to uh, discuss the role of credit in the economic system. And this is where I uh, want to see exactly how, so what is the relevance of uh, credit when it comes to the economic system as well. So I've seen a previous question coming from unit 1.2. So please make sure that you take note of it. So is there any question when it comes to the role of credit before we move on? Any questions? Moving on to unit 1.3, we look at the credit market. And here they say, the demand for credit is ubiquitous as the economic agents fuel scarcity while pursuing unlimited ones with limited resources. So, so when they're talking about ubiquitous, it basically means what? It's found everywhere. So the demand of credit is basically everywhere. Whether you look at it from, uh, where you look at it, wherever, in the economic system, wherever you look, there's always going to be a demand for credit as well, mainly because, because we have um, uh, limited resources for unlimited ones as well. It basically means that the demand for credit is always going to be there wherever you look within the economic system. So here they say, the granting of credit to commercial customers is more complex than personal credit. So this is because commercial borrowers are engaged in a much wider range of activities and their needs for credit vary according to the nature and size of their operation. So business credit is the most common, but for which world trade and the economic progress of mankind would be, would have been impossible as well. So which basically means that for there to be progression within the economic system as well, there is need for credit. And for, to, so for us to see in detail exactly why we need credit as well. We're going to be looking at the advantages and disadvantages of credit. So section 1.4, we look at the advantages and disadvantages of, uh, of credit as well. So it can also be seen as the pros or cons of credit. So here they say, like fire, if used cautiously, credit is useful to mankind. So when you look at the merits of credit, which is also uh, the advantages of credit as well. The first advantage that they give us in this case is wealth creation and maximization. And here they say, why list the, uh, the purpose of this book is to deal with credit risk of commercial credit. It seems appropriate to mention that even governments borrow money much along the lines of business credit. So such loans are expected to be repaid from future government revenue or foreign aid as well. So which means in this case, uh, where government bor is borrows money, we see that uh, where there was this issue of the ETOs as well, where um, the government issues, issued bonds, um, uh, issued bonds, uh, and in this case, um, uh, the government issued bonds for them to be able to raise money that was needed to uh, do, uh, to improve the network uh, for, for, uh, on, on the net N1 as well. And now to pay back that money, the government's plan was to uh, use the ETOs for them to be able to raise the money that was needed to save the loan, uh, the government, the bonds that they issued, they, they what to finance the road network as well. 
So remember what how it also went. I think that issue is still ongoing where people are refusing to pay the e-tolls, but at the same time, the government was also trying to push as much as possible for our people to pay the e-tolls. Reason being, yes, they used credit to use uh, to finance the uh, crash, uh, the 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 the, uh, the building of the road network as well. So which means that there is also going to be cost of credit, which means that the, their plan was to raise money through e for them to be able to service those uh, obligations as well. So under this, they say, so it means if used wisely, credit helps in multiplying wealth much faster and beyond the existing resources of the nation, uh, business, or individual as well. So which means to explain this in, in more detail, they say, we, it, credit basically means that you are using other people's money to make money. So therefore, going to a loan shark and getting uh, charged 25% over one month and use that money to buy groceries only dig you further down as you will be depleting your wealth. Remember we said that we need to use credit to create wealth, which means that if you're going to go to a loan shark, which charges you 25% over a month or even 50% over a month as well. It basically means that if you're going to be using that money and not creating more money, but using that money to buy groceries as well, it basically means that you are not going to be creating wealth, which means that, which means that in this case, credit is not going to be acting to your uh, best interest as well. So the idea behind credit is that you want to be able to access in that money or that source of capital that instead of you having to raise that capital yourself, to pursue these projects of wealth maximization, you can also use other people's money to be able to achieve that goal of what wealth maximization through the use of credit as well. The second advantage is use of credit as a tax planning tool. So here they say in several nations across the world, income tax legislation allows the deduction of interest and installments on housing loans obtained by the salaried classes and self-employed as well. So which means in this case, we're basically saying that use of credit basically can be used as a tax planning tool, mainly because it would also result in you what being able to pay less in what? In taxes as well. So to understand this better, let's look at a company that has credit. Remember credit basically means that you're using debt financing as well, right? So when a company, when you look at a company with no debt, for example, so when you look at a company with no debt, when you look at their financial statement, it would mean when they prepare their financial statement, it would say earnings before interest and tax, let's say it's 100,000. If the company is no debt, it means their interest expense is also going to be zero, which means that the earnings before tax is going to be 100,000. And if your taxes are at say 30%, it means your, the company is going to be paying 30,000 in taxes in this case. But now when we compare this company to a company with, uh, uh, 50,000 in debt, so if a company is, let's say the company is borrowing uh, is debt with 500,000, so if a company is debt with 500,000, right? In this case, it would mean, when we look at the financial statement, it would mean the earnings before interest and tax is going to be 100,000. Their interest expense in this case is going to be 10% of 500,000 is going to be 50,000. So it would mean their earnings before tax is going to be equal to 50,000, which means if the company pays taxes of 30%, so if the company pays taxes of 30%, it means in this case, the company is going to be liable for taxes with 15,000. So do you see that as a tax planning tool, 
use of tech basically means that you are going to be paying less in taxes because initially this company was paying thirty thousand in taxes, but because they are using debt financing, they are only going to be liable for what fifteen thousand in taxes as well. So which basically means that in this case. Uh, debt can also be utilized or credit can also be utilized as a tax planning tool because they are going to be what paying less you know, in taxes in this case, as you can see. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Moving on. The other advantage of credit is convenience. And the other thing, uh, I'll read the whole paragraph in this case. They say, the owners need not bring all the funds to run the show. Often the first generation entrepreneurs who commence a new line of activity may find it difficult to amass enough funds to start and run the whole of uh, the business. Hence, they turn to debt, which is a convenient, me convenient method of raising funds and which can be returned later. So which means if a company wants to raise uh, finance a project with a million. Historically, without debt financing, it means to raise that million to finance a particular project. Remember, when you look at financing of a particular project, you're going to be looking at the accounting equation. Assets is equals to equity plus liability. So we are basically saying that for this particular company in this case, if they want to raise without debt financing, it means the only source of financing would be, it, it would be only equity, isn't it? So it means the owners of the business will have to raise the full million needed to finance the project, to buy the assets of the project in this case, so that they're able to finance the project. But with the debt financing, it basically means that they are not necessarily going to be having to raise the full million to start the project. So conveniently, they can raise a certain amount of money and then they can get the balance through debt financing, which basically means that they are, it's basically convenient because they are able to start that project early instead of having to wait a longer period of time to raise money. That's why you see that uh, the first generation entrepreneurs, they struggle more than the second generation entrepreneurs, mainly because the first gener generation entrepreneurs, they don't have a good credit rate rating, they don't have a good credit record. And because of that, they struggle to get debt financing for their business as well. But now when the business has been running for a longer period of time, when they, if it's now going to be successfully run by the second generation of, of entrepreneurs as well, they're going to be able to, what, to get more debt financing. And if they're able to get more debt financing, what does that mean? It also means that what the organization is going to be able to grow at a faster pace than if the company is having to raise the full um, capital that is needed for the project on its own in that case as well. So which means in this case, um, uh, debt financing, which is use of credit, it is also a convenient way of raising capital that is needed for the business as well. Are we on the same page? All right, moving on. The other advantage is business control. So in this case, uh, when it comes to business control, it means the owners of the business, which is the owner share or holders, they are able to, rein, to retain control of the business. Because remember, when you look at debt financing, use of credit, the debt financing in this case, if they utilize debt financing, debt holders, they don't have a voting right in the business. So they don't have a say, generally, under normal circumstances, they don't have a say on the running of the business, unless under special circumstances as well. So it basically means that the owners of the business, when they use debt financing, they are able to maintain control of the business. Because remember, to finance any need for the assets of the business day, is either they're going to ask the owners of the business to contribute, or they're going to be getting debt financing. So if the owners of the business don't have enough money to finance the assets there, the other way that they can do is to uh, ask other people or third parties to buy more shares of the company, right? And if they're going to ask other people to buy more shares of the company, it basically means that there's going to be dilution of control because initially the original shareholders, they were having 100% ownership in the business. When they invite other people to invest by buying shares of the company through equity financing, 
what is going to happen? They lose control from 100% to a lower percentage. So which means that that loss in control of the business basically means that they are say in the planning of the organization, they are say in the vision of where the organization should be going, they're going to be losing that control over the organization as well. So one way of maintaining the control of the organization is through the use of debt financing. So here they say, with borrowings, the existing owners can enjoy the full benefits of the business after meeting the fixed finance obligation. So what we also mean here is that the owners of the business, because there's no dilution of control of the business, it means the number of ordinary shares is, not, is going to remain the same if they use debt financing as a source of capital. So if they use debt financing as a source of capital, it means the number of ordinary shares is going to remain the same because they're using debt financing. So this also means that the owners of the business are not going to be having a dilution of the profitability of the business as well. Because if they invite more people to invest in the business through equity financing, there's going to be an increase in the number of shares. And an increase in the number of shares, it means that there's going to be a dilution on the earnings per share of the business as well. And the dilution in the earnings per share can also result in the what? Dilution in the dividends per share of the business as well. But without having more owners in the business to finance the project, if they utilize debt financing there, which is the use of credit, it basically means that the earnings per share and the dividend per share are going to remain uh, uh, at a level, mainly because the number of shares uh, are going to remain constant as well. The other advantage is to do with the socio-economic advantages. And yet the other thing, um, um, I will read from the beginning of the paragraph. So here they say, there are many advantages to the society and the country emanating from the business lending. So as the business borrows more and spends, the local society or economy is benefited as more demand is created. So this activity, borrowing and spending or investing by the economic participants in an economy is self-reinforcing because the increased spending results in more income, rising profits, and higher net worth of the business, which in turn results in higher capacity to borrow, uh, which encourages banks and lending institutions to lend more, increasing the spending and investments further in the economy. So all this will result in higher employment creation and improved standard of living. I will read the rest, uh, the rest of the paragraph as well. So overall, the business spending on credit has far reaching implications on the country's economy, which can drive up the demand for goods and services, accelerating economic growth. However, credit induced growth needs to be monitored closely by the government and monetary authorities uh, as it carries bubble risk. So in this case, when you come to bubble risk, we'll discuss it later on in the chapters where this is basically where the economic system is basically, uh, the economic activity is increasing at an unsustainable level. So if the economic activity increases at, a sustainable, at an unsustainable level as well, it basically means that at some point, the bubble is gonna end up bursting and then which results in what? The economic crashing as well. So any growth in the economic activity has to be a sustainable, growth. Otherwise, there's going to be a bubble risk in that case. So is there any questions when it comes to the advantages of credit in the economy? Any questions? <laughs> Moving on to uh, the disadvantages of credit which is the demerits of credit usage. The first one that they discuss is reduced profitability. And I'll read this from the beginning of the paragraph. So here they say, as far as business credit is concerned, it is true that if the return on investment exceeds the borrowing cost, leverage is beneficial to borrowers. On the flip side, when the return on investment is lower than the borrowing cost, the business will suffer from lower profitability. So in this case, 
they are basically saying, remember when, when it comes goes back to economics, an economic decision is deemed to be a good economic decision when the benefits are more than the costs. So when the benefits are more than the costs, that's when we say we have a good, we have made a good economic decision. So in this case, uh, the benefits in this case is going to be the return on investment. So when the return on investment is greater than the borrowing cost, then it basically means what you're making a good economic decision. Like for example, if you are going to be taking out a loan where you are charged 10% interest and you use that money to generate an income which gives you a return of let's say 15%. What does that mean? It basically means that your cost of borrowing is 10%, your return on the investment is 15%. So what does that mean? It basically means that you are using other people's money to make money because you have and an extra 5% return from this investment with other people's money. Hence, it would be a good economic decision. But the flip side of that as well would be the problem of uh, credit as well, where if you are going to be using this money, like what I said indicated previously, where we say that you go on, you borrow money from a loan shark, a 25% interest, you take that money into buy groceries. What does that mean? Your, rate of, uh, your return on investment is going to be zero, but at the same time, the cost of borrowing is going to be 25%. So when your return on investment is less than the cost of borrowing, it basically means that your profitability is going to be reduced, which means that you're going to be in a far away situation that you were previously before you take out this loan as well. The second um, disadvantage of credit is default and bad reputation. So when a company defaults on their obligation, it results in a company having or an organization having a bad reputation. So I'll read through the paragraph in, uh, so that you are not fully understand this uh, point. So here they say, one of the main disadvantages of relying on credit is the inability of the borrower to meet the obligations on time. So if the business runs at below break even, then additional funds of cash need to be brought in from other sources to meet the interest obligation. And it is better not to speak of the principal portion. So any default will not only result in compounding of the interest burden, but most of the financing institutions levy charges such as penalty interest, ETC, adding to the walls. So for, so, so, Instead of improving shareholder value, it can destroy value. So ultimately, the business entity will find itself out of business and with negative publicity. So trust will be lost. So unpaid financial, institu uh, unpaid financial institutions and suppliers and other non-financial institutions, uh, creators will take action that will bring a bad name to the obliga in business cycles. Like for example, the company can end up being what? blacklisted where they are not going to be able to get even more financing from other financial institutions because what? They have defaulted on their obligation as well, which means that defaulting on the obligation, it basically means that there's going to be ramific financial ramifications on the organization because of the bad reputation as well. The next disadvantage is the issue of bankruptcies. And here they say, Almost all bankruptcies are caused by the creditors pressurizing the borrower to pay up. So bankruptcies are not good for the creditors either as they cause credit losses impacting their profitability as well. So which means that uh, bankruptcies, they are bad for both the borrower and the creditor. The borrower, it means that their business is not going to be able to op continue operating because they've been declared bankrupt. And at the same time, the uh, supply of credit is also going to lose out mainly because the company, usually the reason why the company is going to be declared bankrupt is mainly because they are, not, they are not in a position currently to be able to meet those obligations, which means that for every rent that, they, uh, that the supply of credit is given out to the borrower in this case, it may, basically means that what? They are going to be expecting to receive less. So for every rent that they would, would have lent out to the borrower in this case, because of bankruptcy, they would expect what they're going to be receiving 
less money from the money that they've borrowed as well, which means that this is going to result in what? Credit losses to the supply of credit as well, of credit. The next disadvantage is propensity to overspend. So here they're saying, the main disadvantage for users of credit is the tendency to overspend beyond their means. So unexpected drying up of the future flows, say uh, loss of job, falling income from business, sudden delay in collection receivables, accumulation of unsold inventories can result in the repayment defaults and associated costs such as penal interest and final confiscation of the uh, collateral, if any, plus the associated damage to personal prestige as well. So which means you find that in most cases when an individual or an organization borrows money, they end up having a propensity to overspend. And sometimes they, don't, they end up spending that money on unnecessary things. Like for example, a company ends up borrowing money and then they start giving in and organizing Christmas parties, uh, Easter parties and all those other things when they are supposed to be using that money to generate more money as well. So it basically means that the other disadvantage of accessing credit is that the borrower ends up uh, has a propensity what? to end up of spending. And sometimes uh, they end up what? spending on unnecessary uh, expenses as well. So these are the four disadvantages of credit in the economic system. Are there any questions? But on section 1.4.3, we look at the question, is wealth creation through use of credit easy or simple? Uh, and in short, they say, wealth creation using credit, in short, they're basically saying that it's not necessarily, um, they say, if you look at the paragraph before the highlighted, uh, under the highlighted section, say, to put it briefly, whether it is business or managing a country or personal wealth creation, the way that limited resources are managed has a significant impact. So maximization of wealth through optimization, optimal utilization of resources is the true objective of financial management in any context. So the credit, has contractual obligations. However, it can result in additional value of the owners or shareholders if the cost of the credit or, uh, or borrowing is lower, um, uh, is lower uh, than the return for which the borrowed resources are deployed. So debt within limits is safe and will definitely add value, contributing positively towards wealth maximization, so which means Credit, yes, we do need credit mainly because with credit, you are able to use other people's money to make uh, to make money, which means that you're able to uh, achieve the goal of the firm, which is to maximize shareholders' wealth as well. So are there any questions on what we've covered in section 1.4? Any questions? Moving on to uh, section 1.5, we look at the different suppliers of credit. When it comes to the different suppliers of credit, we're not going to look at them in detail. We're just going to mention who they are, but we're not really going to look at them in detail because I don't think they're going to be expect, we're not going to be expecting a question where they ask us to discuss in detail uh, the suppliers of credit. So the different suppliers of credit in this case can be commercial banks, it can be uh, term lending or development institutions, uh, in this case, when you look at term lending or development institution, one typical example in this case would be the private investment corporation, which is the PIC from a South African perspective. Then there's also uh, the public debt market, where one can be able to issue debt from the public sources, like for example, issuing um, bonds. Then there's also other institutions in credit financing. And in this case, this is where, for example, we look at housing finance companies, hedge funds, non-banking subsidiaries of major multinational corporations, 
uh, are some of the significant players in this segment. So insurance companies have a large pool of resources at their disposal, which are, are also deployed in a variety of lending or investment activities. So non-banking financial institutions also play an active role in lease and higher purchase financing as well. So that's basically another source of credit as well. Like for example, if you're going to be uh, going to or you want to buy a car, you can also go to, uh, you can also buy a car through credit that is being offered by these different institutions as well. Then there's also trade credit where they say, another source of credit is the supplier, trader, or from manufacturer who offers credit for short periods ranging from 30 to 120 days. And usually the nice thing about trade credit is that normally uh, trade credit, you usually get it what interest free. Like for example, if your supplier give you the credit term of 30 days, it basically means that uh, you they give you the goods and then they say, pay us within 30 days as well. Under normal circumstances, we will not expect that the interest going to be charged on what? On, the, on trade credit arrangements as well. So that's basically another source of credit as well. Are there any questions so far? Any questions? Now, of interest, we now need to find out exactly. So how does, um, remember we said in financing uh, the bank, from the bank perspective, remember we said in financing the bank, to finance the assets of the bank, we are going to be expecting the ownership orders for the bank to contribute. Then we are also expecting uh, debt financing from the bank. And of interest in this case is the money that is being contributed by depositors as well. So now we are trying to look at the uh, the cycles of money that is uh, that is supplied by depositors to see exactly. So how does this money work? when it comes to the financial institution as well. And going back to these institutions as well, to see exactly what, why is it that um, most financial institutions, especially the banking system as well, tries as much as, as, uh, as, much, tries as much as possible to keep confidence within the banking system and avoid the run for the bank. Remember the run for the bank is basically where, a situation where depositors come and say they want their money. And why we also say sometimes uh, you find a situation where when depositors come and say the, a large number of depositors come and say they want their money, the bank will not be in a position to be able to meet that obligation. So the reason why such events do happen and why the banks try to maintain confidence within the financial system, uh, within the economic system within, uh, of the country as well, is mainly because of the um, situation where there's basically a constant cycle of money that is being deposited and being lent out to customers. And the same amount of money is basically being uh, cycled uh, within the financial system as well. So how it would work is basically through this particular example. So they give us this example where they say, uh, they give us an example of this customer who deposits customer number one? They deposit ten thousand within the banking system, and because the banking system, they are the reserve requirement is ten percent of deposits. It means from this ten thousand, the bank is going to be obligated to maintain ten percent as a reserve deposit, which means that the bank can now use the other nine thousand for these income generating activities, either investing in securities or giving out loans. So what do we see? So they, they are able to advance this 9,000. Then when they advance this 9,000, let's say in simple terms, they advance this 9,000 to a customer, right? So the customer gets this 9,000, take this 9,000, and then they, uh, they use this 9,000 to buy something within the economic system. Let's say for example, they use this 9,000 to buy furniture, right? Then the supplier of the furniture receives the 9,000, takes this 9,000, deposits in the bank. So do you see that 
when they deposit this 9,000 in the bank, the bank has a reserve requirement of nine and, uh, of 10%, which is going to be 900 of this 9,000, which means the other 8,100, the bank is able to give it out again as a loan. So they're able to give it out as, again as a loan to a customer. And this customer goes on to buy, let's say, for example, in simple terms, they use this 8,100 to buy um, to buy a fridge, right? So they go use this 8,100 to buy a fridge. They uh, they pay the fridge to the supplier of the fridge, and then the supplier of the fridge goes back to the bank and deposits the 8,100. And what is going to happen when they uh, they, they deposit the 8,100? The bank is obligated to maintain 10% uh, reserve requirement, which means that the 810 rand is what their bank is going to be maintaining within its books. The other 7,290, they can give it out as loan to other customers as well. So the cycle goes on and on and on and on and on. So the main point being made here is that, do you see that all in all, the 10,000 that is initially being deposited by the customer ends up being deposits of 100,000 within the banking system. So the same 10,000 that is being deposited by the customer ends up being 100,000 that is being deposited within the banking system. Of which of this 100,000, 10,000 is what is going to be the reserve requirement. And the other 90,000 is basically what is being given out as loans to customers as well. So this is the reason why banks avoid a situation where customers have a run for the bank. Because if they have the run for the bank, customers are going to be asking for 100,000. And the bank only has 10,000 within its system which means in this case, they are not going to be able to meet those obligations. This is the reason why uh, banks like VPS, uh, although there are other reasons why they went down as well. One of the reasons why, which basically catapulted everything down the drain is mainly because there was a run for the money for the bank for VPS. And even if you look at Silicon Valley Bank, which is the American bank that recently happened, I think it was last week as well, you see that one of the things that also catapulted their downfall is basically customers making a run for the, for, the, uh, for, for the bank as well. And remember, it's more like a house of cards where, which is maintained, the cards is basically the confidence in the banking system. Without the confidence in the banking system, everything comes down crashing as well. And this is why, uh, the recent case of SV Bank, SVB Bank uh, is very interesting as well, mainly because it's typically this case where the way um, the customers, which is basically uh, IT companies, they were now, because of increased interest rates, they wanted now to start uh, withdrawing their money so that they're able to use that money to finance their op uh, projects as well. And at the same time, when so many customers started asking for their money, uh, our money back, they were forced to now sell some of the, that, which is another issue that we're going to be discussing uh, later on as well, where we look at diversion risk, where instead of using that money, where if you're given that money for deposits, usually you would expect that you're going to be investing that money in short-term instruments. But in the case of SVP Bank, because they wanted higher returns, they invested that money in long-term instruments. And now because the interest has went up, the value of the bonds went down. And because of that, when they were forced to sell those instruments, they were forced to sell those instruments at what? At a loss, which means that there was now, this is what resulted in about $2 billion, uh, $2 billion uh, losses as well, when they were now forced what, to, to dispose of these instruments so that they're able to pay um, the customers who are needing their money as well. So it's very interesting to see exactly uh, how the financial system works as well, which basically means that looking at this example, they say the amount of credit the banking system can create with a single initial deposit can be calculated by the formula, uh, by the following formula. Credit creation is given as the initial deposit multiplied by one minus the reserve ratio divided by the reserve ratio. So this will, this will tell you exactly how much money can be created within the economic system in this case, which is basically credit creation that can be uh, determined within the um, economic system that can be advanced as well. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Any questions?
So this is where we come to an end when it comes to uh, chapter one of the textbook. So this is where we come to an end when it comes to chapter one of uh, the textbook. Is there any question on what we've covered so far in chapter one? Any questions? Please not. As we move forward to chapter two, chapter three, going all the way there as well. At the end of each chapter, there is going to be questions that are going that are highlighted. So as you go through these chapters as well, at the end of each chapter, there is going to be questions which are highlighted. Those questions which are highlighted, please make sure that you go through these questions, because what you're going to do is. After we cover chapters one to 10, when we're done with covering chapters one to 10, so you'll see that in our curriculum, after chapters one to 10, we are going to, it's basically coming from topic one and topic two. So chapters one to 10 is coming from topic one to topic two. So at the end of each chapter, I'll be giving you specific questions you need to answer or to go over as homework questions. Please take note that as soon as we're done with chapter 10, we are going to dedicate a class where we are going to be reviewing the questions that I gave you as homework from chapters two to chapter 10. So please make sure that you take note of that, very, very important. So as we go through these chapters, at the end of each chapter, there's going to be questions that are going to be highlighted. Please ensure that as we go through the chapters, you on your own time, you attempt these homework questions because after we are done with, uh, with chapter 10 of the textbook, we are going to dedicate a class where we are going to review all these questions that I'm giving you as homework uh, questions as well. So please take note of that, very, very important. Are there any questions on what we've covered from chapters one, from chapter one, any questions? All right, if there are no questions, can we take a 10 minutes break until 12.30? Then at 12.30, we're going to move on to chapter two of the textbook. So can we take a 10 minutes break until 12.30? And then at 12.30, we move on to chapter two of uh, the textbook. 